I'd like to introduce to you the first speaker, which is Dr. Ramanan Laksmina Rayan from India. Uh, Dr. Laksmina Rayan is the founder and director of the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in Washington, DC, uh, and also in New Delhi. And he's also a senior researcher um, at Princeton University and an affiliate professor at the University of uh, Washington. Dr. Laksmina Rian is uh, chair of the board of uh, GRDP, a, a global product development partnership that has been created by, by WHO. And he also served as an advisor to the United States president and the Obama administration uh, regarding AMR issues and AMR policies in the past. The, uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Laksmina Rian uh, with us today. Um, the title of his presentation will be the AMR situation in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Laksmina Rian, for the next 30 or 25 minutes, uh, the floor is entirely yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Hens. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to start my speech, if that's OK. Um, so uh, so I was asked to speak on the AMR situation in the context of COVID-19. Now, I happen to be in India, where COVID-19 has become all too real uh, in the sense of the absolute catastrophe that it's caused in the context of the, of the second wave, uh, although there are more than 300,000 reported deaths and something approaching 30 million reported cases. Uh, these are huge underestimates of the actual burden of infections and deaths with COVID in India. Um, th these underestimates are common in many countries, but, uh, but I think they're particularly acute in countries where testing per capita is uh, lower. Uh, India is not the lowest. India does actually quite well by middle-income standards, but still it's not sufficient to be able to capture the true scale of the epidemic. Now, a major cause for mortality has been the lack of admission to hospital beds. So many people, in fact, I would say most people who are dying of COVID are dying even without actually being in a hospital in the first place. So they don't even have the opportunity to die of a healthcare-associated infection. So uh, in, in uh, the current context, one would have to be fortunate to have had a bed in order to even get to the point of having a, a bacterial pathogen, uh, you know, particularly in a healthcare setting. So it's it's ironic that you know it's only the rich that really you know manage to get into these facilities, and therefore it's a you know it's almost the quote unquote privilege of adding, even having a bacterial pathogen in the first place. But that is a situation as such as it exists, and I just wanted to quickly review what we know. Uh, from current evidence, particularly in the developing world, which I have to say is not a whole lot compared to what we know from uh, uh, the U.S. and, of course, a little bit from China. Now, uh, we always have known that uh, uh, secondary bacterial uh, pathogens, uh, infections, are uh, going to be a major cause for mortality in uh, the course of pandemics. In fact, in 1918, 1919, uh, analysis of tissue cultures that were stored from that period of time show that pneumococcal infections were a major cause for influenza-associated pneumonia and deaths uh, in both civilians and in, and, uh, and in uh, military personnel. And you can see that in patients with pneumonia, uh, you know, uh, there's a significant number of positive cultures and uh, patients with documented uh, fatal pneumonia. You could see that the proportion that the numbers positive for pneumococci was also significant. So. We've always known that secondary bacterial infections are important. In fact, uh, they're hard to distinguish because influenza-related pneumonia deaths compared to pneumococcal pneumonia deaths in that period of time, uh, if you look at time for, uh, from illness to death uh, in number of days, uh, they almost are on top of each other because it's a very similar sort of a profile that you see. Now, in the context of COVID, we've had studies from around the world. I'm just highlighting one study that happens to come from Barcelona, which look at 19, 900, 989 consecutive patients with COVID-19, of whom about 7% had other microbiological confirmed infections. And there were about 51 hospital-acquired bacterial superinfections, mostly from Pseudomonas and, and E. coli. 
And most of these tend to reflect the underlying bacterial flora in the hospital, as one might expect. Uh, and these were found in about 4.7% of patients. And uh, mean time from admission to super infection diagnosis is about, uh, you know, it's about 10 days. Um, and overall mortality was about 10%. Now, this is obviously very different in different countries. This is a summary table of what we knew till roughly the beginning of this year, uh, describing secondary bacterial infections. The largest study came from the US, but there have been studies mostly out of China as well. And the clinical outcomes have been that, uh, obviously, a, you know, a significant number of those with the secondary bacterial infections have died. But the proportion ranges from you know, anywhere from about 0.6% you know, all the way to about 20%. In China, the numbers have been higher, 45%. But as you note, the bacterial pathogen has not always been cultured in every particular situation. I'm not going to talk a lot about fungal pathogens, although in the context of COVID, and particularly in, in low- and middle-income settings, uh, uh, mucomycosis and aspergillosis have played an important role in uh, sort of extending the duration of morbidity associated with COVID now, these are not necessarily attributable to hospital infection control or transfer. These are spores that are picked up in the environment, and the causal factors, while not fully understood, are believed to be things like uh, early administration of steroids, which suppress immunity and therefore provide an opportunity for these fungal pathogens to take over. But what is new here in the context of the bacterial pathogens is that a similar mechanism could also be happening in places where there's a significant amount of very early steroid use, which is uh, not indicated or appropriate, but this seems to be very common. In fact, if one were to be tested positive for COVID in India at this time, even with no symptoms, a course of steroids is prescribed by many clinicians uh, for reasons that are not you know, particularly clear. Of course, that comes with a long list of other things, including antivirals, favipiravir, flu, uh, you know, uh, in some cases even remdesivir, which is certainly not indicated for anyone as, you know, uh, asymptomatic and just, uh, you know, just with COVID. But what is coming out is that a lot of polypharmacy and inappropriate use of drugs, particularly in, in settings where clinical guidelines are not strong, are possibly contributing to early, uh, uh, early fungal infections because of early uh, administration of steroids, but could be uh, responsible for, for secondary bacterial pathogens as well. Now, if you look at uh, this study, which was done at Ames, the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, this is uh, New Delhi's or India's sort of best uh, institute, and you look at the resistance profile of clinical isolates causing secondary infections of COVID-19, um, particularly in blood, these are, uh, you know, th these are pretty uh, standard in terms of these are the sort of uh, proportions of resistance that you would see even during normal times, which means very high levels of resistance, which you normally, you know, would see during even during normal times. And this is, of course, from a very, very good lab system. So if you took sterile samples, uh, you see that these are these are high, and similarly from respiratory samples as well. Now, there's a more recent study that literally came out just two days ago, which was done in 10 hospitals that were part of the Indian Council for Medical Research's network uh, across the country uh, for studying antimicrobial resistance. And that study found that 70 of 70,000 odd admitted, uh, admitted patients, about 3.6 percent develop secondary bacterial or fungal infections, but the mortality is significantly higher. It's almost five times greater than the 10.6 percent mortality in total admitted COVID-19 patients. And uh, this was a fairly well done study, very carefully done, very good investigators. But it sort of shows that even though your likelihood is, is not high, uh, the outcomes are pretty bad because many of these are uh, highly drug resistant. Now, I'm going to switch gears to say, um, you know, there are much better talks than mine that are coming up after this on antimicrobial consumption. Uh, antimicrobial consumption has been a bit of a confusing picture for me because there have been parts of the world where consumption has gone up because of indiscriminate use, uh, both in the community and in the hospitals. But there's also been studies, including one much more recently from the United States, which showed that consumption actually went down. So I don't think there's one clear picture with respect to 
antimicrobial consumption and COVID. I think it has been going up in some countries, certainly going up in <coughs> health care settings, but certainly not the case in all countries. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag. In fact, the, uh, the imposition of the lockdowns or of any sort of movement has possibly played a role in reduced prescribing in many places in India, particularly because telemedicine is not possible. I suspect that that's true across Africa as well. However, prescribing has gone up in some parts of the world. And like I said, in the US, it's not, it's not that high. Now, vaccines is really the other big story. This is an area which we've done a lot of work on, uh, but not COVID vaccines. These are vaccines that could help uh, reduce AMR. And I think that uh, one of the legacies of COVID would really be a very uh, different attitude towards vaccines. Now, I'm not sure if it will necessarily be an improved positive attitude because that really depends on the outcomes from these vaccines. But we've known for a long time that vaccines can be effective. Invasive disease caused by pneumococci and other children are to declined in the U.S. post-pneumococcal vaccination. And if you look at COVID, uh, at least the share of uh, people who received at least one dose of the vaccine uh, has been climbing, obviously not as much as one would like. There are many countries which don't show up on this map at all. But in general, this is probably the first global experience with adult vaccination at scale. Uh, we've never done this before. And I have to admit that I would have expected far more uh, hesitancy and concerns than there actually has been. In fact, even in a country which is generally quite vaccine hesitant like France, uh, things could be better, but at least the, the numbers are climbing. And uh, I would not have necessarily bet that one third of the adult population would, uh, would readily take at least one dose and hopefully will move on to two doses. Now, this is not to say that vaccine hesitancy is not a problem or that we don't need to do far more to tackle it. But just to say that we are entering a new era with respect to vaccines, not just on the supply and development side, but also with respect to how vaccines are perceived, which then has important implications for AMR. And the reason is that we now have a number of studies which show that vaccine hesitancy, in this was a study that was done across a number of countries, uh, ranging from China at one end and, and Russia at the other end. And the numbers above the bars represent the percentage of respondents who responded positively to if a vaccine is uh, to COVID is proven safe and effective, then I will take it. And you can see that the numbers are all about 50%, um, and as a high as 88% in China and 85% and in Brazil, but generally quite positive attitudes in a population that generally is not, uh, doesn't really re receive vaccines. And we've known that vaccines do reduce prescriptions and ambulatory care visits. We also know that in the context of AMR, if this were to change, one of the big impacts it could have is on the other big adult vaccine that should be taken at scale, which is the influenza vaccine, which is currently underutilized. Now, the influenza season is not only a key driver of antibiotic consumption globally. I might go as far as saying it is the biggest driver of antibiotic consumption uh, globally. In fact, it's, it's about uh, one standard deviation above uh, the median uh, when in terms of consumption uh, in January, February, and March, and similarly in the Southern Hemisphere, that we know that the flu season is a very, very important driver. If we were to be able to get the flu vaccine to be adopted with significant enthusiasm, that itself could make a big difference to the impact on antibiotic consumption. And I'm talking at a much higher level than really of the particular impact of COVID, you know, specifically on vaccination or on, uh, on consumption today. And in fact, we know that influenza is so significant that in the US, uh, the influenza season is nearly perfectly predicted by antibiotic sales data. So they almost sit exactly on top of each other. So to the point where it's possible to predict uh, or assess the flu season just with antibiotic sales data. Now, if we were to be able to get a flu vaccine out, as was this study showed, that if you control for socioeconomic differences, access to healthcare, childcare centers, climate, et cetera, et cetera, a 10 percentage point increase in the influenza vaccination rate was associated with a 6.5% decrease in antibiotic use. And I think that going forward, as COVID sort of becomes much more of a you know, seasonal or annual sort of an infection, which is manageable through vaccination, 
uh, it is important to also fit that into this flu context to see if we can encourage regular vaccination. Uh, and one of the important outcomes from that would just be that there would be reduced antibiotic consumption. And of course, having the flu vaccine taken up also is quite important. So I think we're entering this era of, of uh, you know, possibly annual, biannual sort of uh, adult vaccinations. And, and what flu can tell us is very important in terms of, of what we might predict for, for COVID-19. Now, moving on, uh, this was a set of studies. Uh, it was actually six studies that we uh, uh, had worked on over the last three years on vaccines and antibiotic use in low and middle income countries. This one was published in Nature beginning of last year. And uh, basically what we looked at was pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the live attenuated rotavirus vaccine. And what we found was that they confer respectively about 20% and 11% protection against antibiotic treatment, uh, treated uh, episodes of acute respiratory infection and diarrhea. And using the current coverage levels, we found that they could prevent about 23.8 million and 13.6 million episodes of antibiotic treated illness, respectively. That's a significant number of, of, uh, uh, of averted antibiotic treated illness. Uh, and so what we find is that at least for these two vaccines, the pneumococcal and the rotavirus vaccine, that the data is very clear. And this is drawn from uh, large scale studies of households that we find that these actually can be quite helpful. In fact, if you look at estimates of attributable fraction of vaccine preventable infections, uh, on the left side, top left, you see all cases where treatment sought and antibiotics are received. And uh, in the B is, again, uh, how much you can actually avert using the, the vaccination uh, coverage. Uh, the total vaccine prevented uh, antibiotic consumption incidents per 100 children. And you can see the uh, across all LMICs, there's a significant amount of this antibiotic treatment estimate that you can actually avert. Uh, compared to the no vaccination, the 2018 coverage, and of course, we were able to get to universal coverage. Uh, there's a constant decline in the number of treated cases that the antibiotic treatment, treated cases that we would have to, uh, to rely on. Um, now, we've also done this for, uh, for tuberculosis, where we've looked at the hypothetical vaccine uh, uh, to look at the impact on reducing active disease and also on rifampicin resistance. Uh, TB burden. And what we found was that this future TB vaccine could avert about 10% of the cases and 7% of deaths over the 2020 period, 2020 to 2035 period. Uh, but it could also avert uh, specifically drug resistant infections, which is really the, the huge value of this, because if you can avert drug resistant infections, then you save a lot of money, which is currently going into providing second line treatment for, uh, for, uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis infections. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the left is a little small to read, but it really shows the projected percentage of, of uh, rifampicin-resistant TB that's averted by a M72-like vaccine. And you can see it's roughly in the 10% range for the most part, you know, higher in some countries. But, you know, I would say somewhere between 10 and 20% is the avertable burden. Uh, and this is the incremental value. The dark red is the incremental value of the M72 vaccine, it's right there. Uh, and this is the country-wise contribution, obviously. India is the largest, China, Nigeria, Indonesia, and Russia, Pakistan. These are the other big countries where the burden attributed is greatest. But then, the, including the vaccine, you can see that India is where this could really have the biggest impact. Now, we've done some work on looking at the value of effective antibiotics during a pandemic, and uh, this was previously unexplored. And what we were able to do was look at the incremental cost effectiveness ratios of school closures, of combinations of, of uh, vaccines, and antivirals, and school closures to look at what the effect would be. And what we found here, just to summarize, is that having a portfolio of effective antibiotics in advance of the next pandemic would be highly, highly cost effective. In fact, these ratios are, are, you know, are pretty high when it comes to influenza-like illnesses. So this is something that we really ought to invest in. And if you look at the sensitivity to pandemic hazard rate, which is what you see on this axis, and the prevalence of the resistance strain, option value is an economic concept. It's really something which is similar to insurance, which is what is the, uh, what is the value of knowing with certainty that you will have a, 
uh, you know, an antibiotic that will work during the next pandemic. And you can see that that range is above $10 billion for many feasible combinations of percentage of secondary infections, resistance strains, and of hazard rates that for any reasonable range around these, that the value of withholding antibiotics, by withholding I mean that you develop a new antibiotic and then you don't really put it into general use, you, you pay for it and keep it on the sidelines so that it's useful as a broad spectrum antibiotic for the next pandemic. It, it could be quite useful as well. Now, I just want to close with uh, just a few slides on uh, the global uh, state of the world's antibiotics report which CDEF puts out every year, which I think is, is something which will be our benchmark to see how AMR has changed between where things are now and where things might be in a couple of years from now when we're hopefully all in a post-COVID world. But this work was done between 2018 and 2020. And in general, the situation was, I mean, all these are published papers as well, but it's also on a report that's on the CDEP website, that uh, there's a significant amount of variability in per capita antibiotic use uh, across countries between LMICs and, uh, and, uh, and high-income countries. But you see that, so this is the, sorry, I, I didn't uh, label this properly. So the right side is uh, LMICs and the left side is, is the, uh, uh, the high, A is high income countries and, and B is LMICs. Uh, and what you see is that uh, generally penicillins tend to get used a lot more in the LMICs and you have uh, not, uh, you know, less and more of the cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones being used in the LMICs, sorry. Um, if you look at the drug resistance index, which is a weighted average uh, that we uh, use of resistance weighted by how frequently a particular antibiotic is used to that specific, uh, to deal with that specific pathogen, uh, in, in effect, it's like a stock market index. It sort of summarizes resistance in one metric for, uh, you know, for you to compare across different countries. And India is definitely the highest in terms of, of aggregate drug resistance. Uh, other countries are not too far behind, but uh, but countries like Finland, Denmark, Canada, uh, Germany are all much, much lower. Of course, you know, when they have more antibiotic treatment options as well, the drug resistance index tends to be lower. Now, when we look at increases in total antibiotic use between 2000 and 2015, you see that it's gone up in some parts of the world, but not everywhere. In French West Africa, Brazil, it's gone up, but not really in... Uh, I'm sorry, I should say Francophone West Africa, not French West Africa, Francophone West Africa, uh, but has really flattened in many other places. Uh, in fact, if you look globally, the increase in consumption between the top and the bottom in, uh, in DID is really around, the increase is all, most of it is in the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. In the blues show that uh, it's actually been a decrease the darker, the, the reds show that's actually been an increase. So you can see that uh, the most of the increase has actually been in the in the tropics and, of course, China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, where much of the increase is really happening. Uh, we've talked about vaccination. Vaccination can be really helpful. And any changes in attitudes because of vaccination due to COVID uh, could result in both fewer infections, which lowers disease transmission and, and burden, but also uh, lessens the antibiotic consumption. Uh, we've done a lot of work on components of a checklist that could be used in resource-poor settings. Unfortunately, even the existing stewardship programs have fallen apart during COVID in healthcare settings because they're all overrun and, and, and uh, not really functional at all. So we really need to rethink how we're doing stewardship again in a, in a crisis situation. Uh, we've not talked a lot about animal use, but animal use basically is is a significant proportion. You can see that human use is, is this great part, but the rest of it is all animal use. It's going up steadily over time, uh, and most of it goes to chickens and pigs. So we do need to focus on the, those areas as well. Resistance is a problem in animals itself. Uh, over the period from 2000 to 2018, in this paper published in Science, we found that resistance went up by, by almost you know 60% in chickens and pigs uh, over that period of time. And uh, there are ways of reducing antimicrobial consumption in food animals, not the primary focus of this webinar, but I think it's something for us to pay attention to. And last but not least, I think the left side of the 2013 situation with respect to new drugs, 2019 is a situation with uh, uh, new drugs now. And I think the pipeline has definitely improved, although we're still a long way from getting to where we need to be. 
Now, this report also has dashboards by country, so this is just an example of such a dashboard. But I'll stop you in the interest of time and uh, and happy to take any questions. Again, thanks to uh, the University of Paris and Fondasi Mario for inviting me. Thank you.